so yeah so thanks everyone for joining in this workshop um so yeah so when i originally planned to for this to take place that was when we had um our edinburgh, edinburgh hub um sort of in the motion um, and i thought we'd all be able to sit and talk whilst we made something and um rather than have the same format online where we all make the same thing i recognize that you know it might be more difficult in getting materials in advance so the plan for today is just to share these slides and um, talking through my interpretation of craftivism and how we can use it to support fashion revolution. Um, so we will have some time at the end to have a discussion about our own ideas and also this should all be recorded so that um, we can share it as well on our other fashion revolution in Scotland platforms. So. Who am I? Um, so I'm Karen. Um, I'm a volunteer with the Fashion Revolution Scotland team. Um, by day, I suppose I'm a trained as a researcher with a background in geography. Um, so I kind of got involved with Fashion Revolution when I was writing my undergrad dissertation. So I was looking at um, secondhand clothing. And um, since then, for my master's, I had a look at repair i was looking at specifically toy repair and the emotions around that and the material of the objects and within my masters we also got to do um have a look at more creative use of methods and research and this is kind of how i heard about craftivism before but it was in this that i decided oh wow this is actually an opportunity to give this a go and to use it so um i'm a long time sewer i've been making my own clothes since I think I was about 11. Um, I recently took up knitting the past few years. I'm an avid sock knitter and um, I constantly always have a pair of socks on the go and um, I'm now also a craftivist. So if you're looking to get in touch as well, I have an Instagram um, which I've just started recently so there's not a load of posts yet and um, just about making and also I'm available also to get in contact on Twitter. Um, so yeah so fashion revolution week and um, so today the 24th of april marks the seven year anniversary of the devastating rana plaza factory collapse in bangladesh where more than 1100 people died and another 2500 were injured making it the fourth largest industrial disaster in history it was then that fashion revolution began um, in order to challenge the industry because we believe that no one should die for fashion. And since then, fashion revolution has grown as a global movement. As we can see here, we're all sitting in 2020 in a sort of different moment of crisis. You know, and we have seen some positive change across the industry in these more recent years. However, human rights abuses and environmental degradation and remain rife within the fashion industry. And then, although whilst vast members of the public have, uh, vast numbers of members of the public have become more aware of these problems, um, us all included as we're here today, um, but many people aren't so aware and remain in the dark and so are unaware that their clothes may be contributing to the climate crisis and human exploitation. Um, so, you know, fashion revolution, we are a fashion positive movement and I love clothes. Um, I think they're so interesting, their cultural influence, the creativity that they inspire, and the way that they bring people together through the complexity of the supply chain, but also emotionally as we share clothes across generations or make them ourselves. Um, so at any opportunity, I love wearing and talking about clothes. Um, and I believe that it is possible that we can create a positive fashion industry which respects both people and planet. And I think this year in light of coronavirus, which has changed the way we do things in all aspects of our lives. Um, yes, hi. A, hello, sorry. Oh, sorry, I thought someone um, said something there. Um, so yeah, so in light of coronavirus, I think this has changed all aspects of our lives. And I think across the globe, Fashion Revolution Week is even more um, important as garment workers have been put in difficult positions of going to work without protection and to choose between their health and safety and surviving. And as well, we've seen brands that have placed orders but have not paid up. And you know this will result in mass unemployment. 
We've also seen those in the UK um, in distribution centres still fulfilling online orders but without protection themselves and those in retail positions as well um, are kind of uncertain about the future of their jobs and also those producing PPE for the protection of our health workers and general public but often again they don't have protection themselves in all these complexities of the supply chain um, but also kind of what we can see in lockdown is that this has also been an opportunity to connect with our wardrobes to slow down and to take time to repair and care for our clothes um, and to spend time sharing our message with brands and our friends and also to most importantly connect with each other even if it is across the screens um, so that we can learn share our knowledge and passion and also take collective action which is now possible to do across the world as all of our events are also online this week which has been absolutely fantastic being able to both attend events from the Scotland team but also you know um, across in America and down in London that you know we wouldn't have the same access so it's really brought a lot of people together and um, so just to kind of lead on from that the four themes of um, Fashion Revolution Week 2020 were consumption, composition, conditions and collective action. So I kind of wanted to bring craftivism into this theme of collective action. Um, so here I've got a definition for collective action. So individual actions are important, but not, to, not enough to bring about the systematic change needed to end the exploitation of people and the planet in the global fashion industry. We must join forces because we are louder, more powerful, and stand a better chance of achieving change when we work together. So I think there's a lot of potential for collective action, despite us all being indoors and by ourselves. So right now, I think we're seeing a lot of a sort of strengthened capacity for empathy with each other in the current global pandemic, as we find everyone's in the same situation in some regards of being in a lockdown setting. So it's important to ask for change for those most more vulnerable than ourselves here. Um, and also to use our voices collectively on social media. Um, and we've seen this in Fashion Revolution Week with sharing the hashtags of who made my clothes and love clothes last. But it's also a time that we can kind of take some time to reflect because I think in some ways we've been forced to slow down where we might not have had this opportunity to come back in and have a look at our wardrobes and you know get down to that mending pile or take a deep breath and think what is it that we strive for after this pandemic so leading on what is craftivism um, so in its basic essence craftivism is using craft as a tool for activism so it was first coined by Betsy Greer in America um, so I've got a couple of quotes from her here, which I think give a real good essence of what craftivism is. So it's a way of looking at life for voicing opinions through creativity, makes your voice stronger and your compassion deeper. And then I've got another quote from Betsy Greer here as well is, the creation of things by hand leads to better understanding of democracy because it reminds us that we have power. So craftivism is a way of using the tools of craft as activism to take agency ourselves in the process of asking for change. And um, so Sarah Corbett started the Craftivist Collective. Um, and this is also another interpretation from her. And I'll use a lot of Sarah Corbett throughout this because well, both her and Betsy Gur are absolutely amazing. I know a lot more than I do. So um, sometimes a quote from someone else can be really helpful because they just explain it better. So um, craftivism as a form of gentle protest, craftivism aims to be a way of sparking thought and conversation about global and local issues through crafted, crafted objects. So Sarah Corbett established the Craftivist Collective, um, which is where I've used a lot of the material for today's presentation. Um, because her book and website are really great. So if you're looking for more, I've added a few different links and I'll share also this presentation after. Um, and she often discusses how she found herself to be a burnt out activist. She was doing a lot of petitions and she'd always been involved in activism. So she took up cross stitch and realized that actually this 
could be used as a more gentle form of protest and was it a was also effective as a form of activism, but also was regenerative for herself to kind of take a moment and to work with her hands. Um, and one of the joys as well with craftivism is that because it's handcrafted objects, and as I'll go on to discuss, these can be placed out in public. And there's a sort of magic of the unexpected of seeing a handcrafted object where you don't expect to see it. And this can often be what prompts engagement is actually oh look that's a little stitched banner on a lamp post I didn't expect to see that there where someone maybe online would scroll through the feeds and feeds of images or posters or that sort of thing so I think it's quite um personal in a lot of ways so up here on this slide um is a craftivist manifesto I'm not going to go through it now um just because there's quite a lot of different points but um this is really helpful, I think, if you're thinking about a craftivist project to kind of keep these thoughts in your mind about what you want to achieve um, in it. So, oh, I'll just stay on that slide. Um, so what I think is that craftivism ties in really well with fashion because it connects us to the materials and the skills by which clothes are made. So again, I've got a few more quotes. Um, I think this should be the end of the quotes, but, um, these are from the fashion revolution fanzine and um, fashion craft revolution. So this first one's from Carrie Summers, the co-founder and director of global operations at Fashion Revolution. So craft is a physical manifestation of beliefs and values, a symbolic language. Craft is about relationships, the passing of skills from the grandmother to the mother to her daughter. So I think we can see with the heritage of craft that is got this longevity and culture that, you know, I know that I learned how to sew from my grandmother and she is an inspiration to me every time I pick up a needle and thread or my knitting needles because she was just so good with her hands. But for lots of people, I think, especially my generation, they might have missed out on this. And I think it's kind of touching back and thinking about what our core skills are that we need for a resilient future and craft is part of them. I've got another quote here from Ursula de Castro, the other co-founder of Fashion Revolution, and also the creative director of Fashion Revolution from the same fanzine. So, because crafts are so inextricably linked with our idea of history, it's hard to imagine them as anything other than a portal to our past. When in fact, for millennia, they were the opening to the future, a testament to our ingenuity, mobility, our creativity, and our productivity on all levels. So I think, although quite often craft has had this perceived nostalgia, it's actually as modern as anything of picking up and using what you've got around you to make something. I think that's part of what human, humans are designed to do. We just can't help ourselves, whether you're at the beach outside and you're building a sandcastle of the materials you find, or you start playing with a bit of paper to fold it up into a shape. And I think craft is part of that, it's part of our history. So I think with craftivism, despite the sort of modern technological stuff we've got online, that actually it's a really strong tool for activist toolkit because it does let us have that personal element. So the next section, I'm just gonna discuss some key elements that I think are really important to craftivism. So the first one is that it's a gentle protest. Um, so I think craftivism can be interpreted in a manner of different ways. Um, but I like what Sarah Corbett discusses about it being gentle protest. For example, she uses um, mini banners, which she's hand stitched with scraps of fabric, and she pops them just below the eye line of what people can see in public, whether it's on fences or lampposts. And in this way, it makes people feel special when they spot it because they've had to look for it in a way or they've just caught it out the corner of their eye. And because of that, they stop and read it. And because it's unexpected, um, it can make people actually engage with it where, you know, if it was right in your face. So it's this gentle form. Um, it can also be, craftivism can take the form of, you know, wearing something, um, that maybe you've made, whether it's a badge, I'll show later on a shirt that I've embroidered. Um, 
and that can actually work as a way to initiate conversation with other people rather than demanding someone start a conversation with you someone might say oh that's interesting why are you wearing that um, and the same can be said for crafting in public which isn't so simple now um, but these acts of um, gentle sort of presence um, can spark curiosity for people to ask what you're doing um, and I know that I've found I've had some great conversations with people quietly knitting on the train that they've actually started a conversation with me where probably we would have sat in silence otherwise and we've had some really great stuff I remember one time a really little kid I think he was there with his um mum and he saw me knitting he's like what are you doing and he was just absolutely fascinated and I think it's getting people used to the fact that people do make stuff um so I think it's you know the nature as well of handcrafted objects makes these also seem more approachable because you can tell that they're made by someone by hand you know the stitches maybe are a bit wonky and that doesn't matter you know that's all part of your own signature of something that you've made and so I think um, also when we word statements that we're maybe embroidering or um, using in our craftivism to make them actually sort of questions maybe rather than statements about where, the way the world is and this can maybe help people find their own perspective of and challenge the status quo in that sense of asking you know why is it that so many people live below the poverty line why is it that garment workers aren't paid properly and kind of that when you start to ask why you kind of that makes you think what is the reason behind this to go investigate them so the picture i've got up at the moment is an example again from the craftivist collective sarah corbett and um it's an example of her don't blow it campaign and um, so when she moved into a new area and um, she was in contact with her mp and was constantly emailing her with petitions and phoning and you know all those sorts of things and her MP actually asked her to stop wasting her time because she was like you're just bombarding me with this information that I can't possibly um respond to and it's quite harassing actually being constantly I know that if I have a full email inbox in I just don't want to deal with it so I totally understand and um, so instead Sarah decided to hand embroider a hanky with a careful message that asked her MP not to blow it in this opportunity that she had to make a difference. And this she actually found um, fostered um, a relationship between her and the, her MP. And her MP actually now keeps the hanky in her office as a reminder that actually, yeah, she is in a position of power. Um, so this image is actually an example where a group of craftivists um, made hankies for the chiefs at Marks and Spencers um, to ask them to pay their workers a living wage, um, which they then hand embroidered different specific messages and then um, personally gifted it to them. So I think what we can see in this form of gentle protest is that we can actually achieve a lot by slowing down with our activism and, you know, just taking the time to make something and sharing it. Um, does that help actually those in power recognize the time and thought into your message where perhaps it's much easier for them to glance over an email where if you've received something in the post or someone's personally given it to you, actually you recognize the human behind that and that it's not mass generated response. Obviously, there's a whole lot of value to also sending out lots of emails and petitions. But craftivism is an extra tool um, for our activist toolkit. So, um, so the next part is again looking at slowing down. And as I mentioned earlier, in some ways, coronavirus has you know forced a lot of us to slow down, um, as we are based at home. So I'm absolutely loving Fashion Revolution Week and all the amazing events because it's great. I can go to met so many because they are online. But at the same time, I know that probably a lot of people are feeling the same fatigue at looking at a screen all day. Um, and actually, craftivism is a chance to have some quiet time to kind of reflect and actually 
take our minds off all the news and that sort of thing or to think about it in a different sort of headspace and um, so I think you know it's craftivism can be a way to slow down where we switch everything off and connect with our hands and the materials that we're working with to reflect on um, what we um, find valuable and so actually you know with so many online petitions and things to get involved in which is amazing um, and immensely valuable there's actually a lot of benefit for regenerative culture of slowing down our activism to take time to ourselves and um, so I think craftivism in a lot of ways is an additional tool for our activism toolkit which gives us time to connect with our hands and materials um, and to also source materials from what we have around us in our homes. You know, that old t-shirt, turn it into your own slogan t-shirt by embroidering it. You know, that's something that's a bit worn out that can be cut up and you can turn it into a mini banner. So it's connecting with the materials around us to kind of think about how we can use them and interpret them in a different way that shares our message. Um, and also an opportunity to use skills that we haven't used in a long time or to learn new ones where, you know, there's so much you can learn on YouTube or phoning up, you know, your elderly auntie and asking her, you know, how do I do this thing or even just having a chat about that, I think is really valuable. So craftivism in that sense can connect us to other people and also get us just used to working with our hands again. Um, so the next one is sharing and connecting with others. So I think obviously right now how we're working in the world has changed a lot. So we can't necessarily go out the same, but we can still share what we're making online with people. So these couple of photos are actually um, from my own um, Instagram when I shared um, last year for Fashion Revolution a shirt that I embroidered. Um, so even if at the moment um, you make something and you want to share it publicly, you can do this online or equally you can make something through craftivism, which is a reminder in your daily life that you can pop up to, you know, think about the change you want to see in the world or to remind you to do actions or to get involved. And I think actually just having a little positive something to have a look at, to be like, right, there is positivity and hope because I think especially right now, looking for hope and thinking right what do I want to come out of this strange strange time um, so with craftivism we can either do this personally by ourselves um, and use this time as a time to reflect perhaps before you start a session of craftivism maybe different to craft just a craft regular crafting session is maybe write down some questions that you want to think about about what do you think you could do to stop the environmental impacts of the fashion industry? What do you think, you know, would help um, other people in your community? And maybe use this time to reflect. Um, and so, but craftivism can also be a way to connect with others. And I know I really enjoy crafting with other people. Um, so whether it's a session where everyone is working on their own project and you do it over a video call and you just kind of have each other on in the background to maybe share ideas as you come up with things or to share thoughts or you can always um maybe plan a project with some people you know and maybe that's something we want to come out of this session where you work on something individually and then collaboratively it can be put together in the end and um, but there's a lot of value actually i think in making whilst listening and um, i know that I did a stitch and bitch session early on in the week and we all said how much we enjoyed listening and talking whilst also working with our hands because it gives you the moment to actually if you want to stay quiet you can stay quiet and to think about your own words and to think about what other people are saying and again Sarah Corbett has an amazing quote um so using your hands whilst listening means you engage more deeply so it's a good thing when we engage our head, hands and heart together. So I think, you know, there's a benefit of actually crafting with other people. And although online it's a little bit different, we still do have possibilities to do that and to connect to one another. Um, I think also, you know, you can use it as an opportunity to maybe connect with someone that you've not 
had as much connection with recently, as I said earlier about, you know, phoning up an elderly relative. I think craftivism in that sense is a way to get people that might be put off regular activism in the fact that they find it too shouty or they're not really sure how to get involved. Um, but actually craftivism is a way that it's a more gentle form of protest. So, you know, reaching out and maybe having a conversation. I know that my grandparents love clothes. They all have way too many jackets and I have to do tell them that, do you really need that other jacket? Um, but, you know, these sorts of conversations you can have whilst explaining, you know, stitching or that sort of thing. And, you know, they're the people that have that generation of um, more make do and mend in mind. I think that's where I've learned skills, but also sometimes, you know, reminding them that there is that also environmental precedent and also the humans behind um, who make our clothes. So the next um, section, I'm just going to talk through some examples. A couple are from the Craftivist Collective and another one is from my own um, craftivism. And then after that, I'll open up for some conversation, discussion, questions, whatever we feel like. Um, oh, this is just a fab banner I saw when I was at Processions, which was for the um, anniversary of the um, women's vote in the UK and there's some amazing banners so I just thought I'd share that one because it's just fabulous um, and it's a really good example. Um, so the first one is mini fashion statements which is um, a craftivism project that was organised by um, the Craftivist Collective. I did actually make some myself and in true Lou Peter style, I do have some that I made <laughs> earlier. Um, and so with these mini fashion statements, what you can do is take a lovely little bit of paper and write a message which says, you know, if clothes could talk, what would they say? You know, what, if, who was the person that made me and kind of question that and then you know, write it really neatly. There's some good examples. Um, and then also writing the tag at Fashion Revolution, rolling them up. So it's like a real proper little surprise, a lovely little thing to find. Um, tying them up with some nice ribbon. And what you do is instead of um, shoplifting, it's called shop dropping. <laughs> where if you were in a shop, you would pop it in the pocket of, you know, say something in a high street store. So the person that comes along to buy it or try it on might pop their hand in their pocket and be like, oh, what is this? And, you know, it's just a more gentle way of kind of getting people to think about it. It's not telling people not to buy things because that's not right either, because we shouldn't boycott things because this industry does, you know, employ people and we do need things to wear. But it's a way of kind of more gently nudging people into the understanding of recognizing the story behind their clothes. So obviously this Craftivism isn't so applicable now because we can't get into shops, but um, I'm quite excited for when I can pop my little um, fashion statements into some clothes and kind of, you know, you might see people's reactions, um, but equally also the whole point is you put it in there, it's a mystery, you don't know who's got it and then you can walk away. And I think something similar can also be done. Um, if there's something that you love and you're going to give it away to charity, and um, to actually, you know, if it's something that's had a real story or it was, you know, a family member's, but actually you're not going to wear it and you don't know why you're keeping it, writing a little story actually can be a really nice surprise of getting people to connect with their clothing. I think secondhand is really exciting in that sense. So that's mini fashion statements. And um, the next one is mini banners. So again, I've kind of mentioned this, but it's using little bits of fabric or you can do it as bunting or there's lots of different ways and um, this example um, was in Somerset House by the Craftivist Collective um, during Fashion Week which you know questions that you know the lowest paid models at London Fashion Week are paid £125 an hour where the majority of garment workers in Vietnam pay, are paid £25 a month. So kind of putting these statements out and making them again these little handmade objects you know popping it on a lamp post or popping it you know somewhere and you, they, you might not want to do craftivism right now that's related to fashion obviously this is fashion revolution week so that's the main focus but it could just be something that sparks joy for people that when they're out on their daily walk I know that I've really enjoyed seeing all the rainbows and 
picking out which ones I think are the best <laughs> and that sort of thing and counting them and seeing if there's any new ones like captivism can also it can challenge us but it can also just just be a way to spark joy and um, so yeah mini fashion banners or mini banners are really simple to making and um, again I've added in the links here if you want to look up how to do them but you can use just what you've got as well so if that's an old t-shirt that's totally fine and um, so yeah so this was my example so last year um for fashion revolution week i decided that i wanted to do some craftivism so i hadn't really done any before um but what i had was um i had this yellow shirt that i bought second hand i'd worn it for quite a few years but i found it quite big and i don't know i was kind of like i'm not really sure how i feel about it and um i'd inherited a set of embroidered of um, embroidery threads these lovely colorful threads and I thought actually I've never really done any embroidery I could actually do something with this so I decided um, within that to stitch onto the shirt various different messages and it was something that I've added to over time and actually now looking at it this year I might want to unpick some of them and update some of the statistics that I've got as well and um, but I, what I found was that um, wearing it during Fashion Revolution Week and throughout the year is that it was a really good way of sparking conversations where um, people would come up to me and be like wow that's really cool what's that about and I would explain what Fashion Revolution was and um, how I was involved and this picture is actually me at the um, climate march in Edinburgh um, where I didn't have a banner with me but I was wearing my shirt and on the back I've got a big earth embroidered with fashion shoes to cost the earth so I was holding it up it was quite tiring actually <laughs> not having like a, a set banner but holding it up like that and I thought it was actually a really good way to highlight fashion's impact on the climate and um, so whether you might not have want to do a full shirt but actually having something that you can wear and you know not necessarily approaching people but people approaching you because they they read what you have to say and think oh kind of gives them a second take of that's not a slogan t-shirt it's not you know um because yeah what kind of sparked my interest was this was around about the same time there was the um spice girls t-shirts which were being produced that said hashtag i think girl power or it was something some sort of feminist slogan but they found out that actually um the female garment workers were being really maltreated and not paid correctly and I thought actually we have so many clothes nowadays that have words on them but what do those words actually mean so because obviously I don't know who originally made the shirt because it's an old Marks and Spencer shirt that I got in a charity shop but you know the statements that I'm putting on and embroidering because it took time I was able to think about what I was doing and actually to think you know the time it took me to embroider that that's also just a fraction of the time that it takes to make all of our different clothes and um, so that was that's been my kind of involvement I think I would definitely like to do more of it because I found it to be a really positive experience of communicating with people about fashion revolution who maybe as well just even friends when I wear it they know that I'm involved but they might not always want to bring it up in conversation but that sort of thing it does spark that and um, so that's kind of my involvement was um my shirt last year as well and um i sorry i just got it here on the end of my ironing board um but also i've got some patches as well some fashion revolution ones and i think i should be getting some hold of some of these ones so if you would like some um i can maybe send them out to some people if you're in the uk as well so they're great as well because you can stitch them on stuff which i always Think's really fun and it saves you um so yeah so to kind of sum up um these were some thoughts i had um about craftivism it's not extensive there's a whole load of stuff online or in books that you can find um but these were kind of my ideas of how we can use craftivism especially in the current climate you know so whether it's just taking time this week to switch off all your screens and make something or to repair something because i think repair is a re revolutionary act you know to actually have something that you've stitched up yourself and said actually i'm not going to go with mass consumption i'm going to stitch up this hole in my sock and i'm going to wear these until they're threadbare you know nowadays repair is a revolutionary act um 
And within this, you know, share these things on social media that you're making tag brands. If you, you know, I might, I should probably tag Marks and Spencers, you know, who made my clothes? I've got it stitched on one of your shirts now. Um, and, you know, you can always have a making session with your friends online, communicate with people there and um, think about kind of what things might you want to do together or um, kind of in future as well. Um, so I hope this has been an interesting insight into craftivism for everyone. Um, I've added some useful links to both um, the fashion revolution design that I use some of the quotes from, Betsy Greer as well, um, and also Sarah Corbett from the Craftivist Collective, as they've got a whole load more information than I do. Um, and then also I've got shared our links to Fashion Revolution Scotland, so and also Fashion Revolution. We've got a whole bunch of events still coming up. And also if you're like myself, where you like, wow, there's so much going on, but also you can't fit it all in in one day. Everything should be recorded and we will be sharing it online. So if there's anything you thought, wow, actually, I want to look into that a bit more or find out about the you know human rights record or that sort of thing, have a look on um, our social media. And then also the end is just me. So Karen making things. Um, where I will be sharing some more of my making. Um, so yeah, so I'm happy to answer some questions now or if we want to have more of an open discussion. And um, also I totally understand if you want to go off and get a cup of tea because it's about that time of the afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, for joining, I really appreciate everyone attending um, as it's great to get so many people involved in fashion revolution. Where can we get the slides from? I will um, post them on our the event page for Facebook for this. Um, so I'll do that just after this. And then I'll also try and get them up either if you're not on Facebook, on Instagram, or um, I'm trying to think what other ones. If we do a YouTube of this, I'll also post it in a link there because I understand there's a lot of information and I, I try to put it all in there. <laughs> um, can I ask a question? You, mm -hmm. you mentioned about a possible collaborative project. I just wondered if you've got anything in mind at all? Or... Yeah, well, it's something we had a sort of lunchtime stitch session um, earlier on in the week for Fashion Revolution, and we said how much we enjoyed just having even like this on Zoom, and we're all just talking and we're all doing individual projects. So kind of from there, we've talked about maybe doing something not every week, but maybe bi-weekly or each month. Um, so kind of, yeah, I think it would be really nice to do a collaborative project because I think mm -hmm. it's something I quite like to do. I've not really come up with any ideas. So obviously, if anyone has any ideas, that would be great. But um, we'll hopefully try and get that organised with the Fashion Revolution Scotland team because I know that I really enjoyed it because I used to go to a knitting group and... I just really enjoy making with other people because I think you have really fruitful conversations. So if you are interested, um, keep in touch with our social media and I'll try and update it because I think we want to carry on the momentum that we've had this week as well. I'm, I'm struck by the, um, you know, I'm on various Facebook groups. Yeah. The, the face masks, there's been a huge thing yeah. about people wanting to make PPE for other people. Um, which is a really interesting kind of it's almost like a craftism in itself isn't yeah. it yeah well I didn't actually share it but one of the things that um Sarah Corbett did was she used to do the Craftivist Collective they actually did make masks with statements and they put them on um like statues and stuff in public yeah. um which I thought was it, it's a kind of interesting one in these current times but um I think obviously, yeah, making PPE for other people is really important. And I've seen various different campaigns about making scrubs and people look like the Von Trapp children, but you know, it's great that they've actually got the equipment that they need. Um, so yeah, I think even doing something like that as well. And you know, if we're making it ourselves, it's using up fabrics that we've got and that sort of thing. And I think not necessarily that they're always hospital grade or that sort of thing, but 
for us in the general public and those vulnerable members that we know that might be quite a good idea to just even get us kick started right now um, in the current circumstances and then you know we can plan something else if we think there's another idea of something that we'd quite like to do so yeah I think I'm definitely keen if other people are to do some collaborative making because I think that would be really great to come out of this I was thinking along the the flag um, idea thing with the yeah. celebrations coming up in May where mm -hmm. you could maybe think about um, what being you know Britain it actually itself is mm -hmm. but include some of uh, maybe a fashion revolution revolution like you say a question on it so that it's a permanent flag that you've got that's yeah. from, from this period but also you're taking it forward that's yeah I think that, that sounds really good because I think it's um, obviously right now we've got a lot of momentum in Fashion Revolution Week and maybe people who aren't aware of it but it's keeping it up throughout the year so I think having something that people can engage with you post this week as well is um, fab so um, yeah that sounds great and I think also what I find really interesting is that you know in the UK we've also got such a heritage with textiles my town that I live in you know we're we had a previous um, linen industry from those with hand looms in their cottages to then um, big factories and now the factories being rebuilt into flats and that sort of thing. So I think it is really interesting to kind of look at that and, and to kind of see how, you know, fashion is related to our history as well. And I think that's the great thing about craftivism and also um, that sort of activism is that you can make it more locally based to think, wow, we've got these, we used to have these skills, um, why haven't we got these skills now and using that as a call for people to come and learn how to sew or that sort of thing as well. So I think that sounds like a really good idea. If anyone else has any thoughts or that sort of thing, then we can continue. But also I understand that um, that's probably time as well but if you've got any other questions as well you're more than happy to drop me a message or to post in the fashion revolution scotland page and um, i'll try my best to answer them or direct you in the right direction of um someone that maybe knows more um or where i've seen a lot of good links because that's half the thing is that you find so much amazing work online um but um, thank you all for joining. It's been really great. This is my first ever webinar, so I'm glad that it's gone okay and that my ironing board has stayed up and has not half collapsed halfway through because that was a bit of a fear, but um, I'm thankfully in an okay position right now. Could I ask another quick question? Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm halfway through a degree at Harriet Watt. Okay, um, yeah. And uh, thinking about research projects. And yeah. Because I hadn't actually come across the word craftism until today we're yeah. standing up for here and quite but it's been something that I've been thinking in my own head for long yeah. time um, I just wondered if you know of research that's going on yes um so I wrote an essay last year for my um geography course but there's a lot of academic literature actually on craftivism right. so I think I still have all my reference lists so if you want Emma yeah. Um, I can send that over to you because yeah. yeah I kind of I'd heard about it but I hadn't realized actually within academia people have been studying it as well so um, yeah there's loads of great journals and stuff and I think most of them are pre it depends obviously on your access but yeah. um, that I've got some kind of the more theoretical perspective of looking at it but um, yeah I'm happy to share those with you if you want um, Thanks yeah you can either um put a private message in this chat with an email address or that sort of thing and i can get that over to you because and okay. um, just as a starting point because i'm sure you'll find more <laughs> as you dive into it but um yeah with research what degree are you doing um well it's uh, i am now doing fashion technology but I, i'm kind of flitting between that and design but okay uh, it's my second sort of career yeah Picking and choosing a bit as well, um, but you know I love. I mean Tracy Emmons' tent, yeah, just incredible, and um, I just yeah, and and the it's the feminist angle as well. It's really yeah. interesting, and 
there's lots of facets to it that I'm quite interested in. Yeah, I didn't I didn't bring it up in the talk today, but um, I think that's a again I think politically with craft is that it's predominantly to see be seen as a sort of fem feminist um sort of the history in terms of craftivism as well when you look at the suffragettes and those banners that and um, the example i showed from processions is that also suffragettes were stitching and um, messages into their underskirts and that sort of thing but also yeah craft and embroidery and that kind of heritage is always seen as the feminine and so i think it is quite politically charged as well mm. as um how you know something can be sort of reconstituted is actually like this is us taking agency for stitching we're not just stuck at home stitching anymore we're stuck at home stitching but with a purpose and to you know um take down you know the white men that are at the top of uh which arguably again are at the top of the fashion industry so um yeah i think there's there'd be a lot of stuff if you're looking for research projects to kind of go Great. down that line as well but yeah i'm happy to send over um what information i've got um because although I was in geography, this sort of stuff crosses lots of disciplines, so. Yeah, great, um, I'll send my email off. Thanks. Yeah, that'd be great, Emma, and I'll um, get back to you with those as well, because I do, I was dipping into that essay earlier today, so I know, I know where it is, it's not um, hidden somewhere else that I'm not so sure of, so. It's quite interesting though, talking about, um, I've recently come across quite a few male knitters and, mm. and things, which I think, it would be quite nice to have a, a mix like that, you know, when you're talking about stitch and bitch or knit and knit and category. Yeah. It would be nice to have a mix of different, um, you know, people, not necessarily, you know, just to sort of add different dimensions to it and, like you say, open up conversation. Yeah, because I think it's something that um, in the past was maybe stigmatized. Although my granddad talks about learning how to knit at school, but I think by the point, I was at school I didn't really get any sewing at school at all so I'm all self-taught or learnt off um, my gran at home when she was able to um, but I think yeah it was something that was mentioned in a talk earlier the fashion question time with fashion revolution and um, someone mentioned how she'd seen a lot more men taking up the past few weeks these kind of um, hobbies of knitting and that sort of thing I think it is actually it'd be really good the knitting group I used to go to we had a sort of it was a mix of ages and that sort of thing and um, that was down when I was living in Exeter and it was great um, and we had a few guys that also came and um, just adding to the dimension because I think sometimes it does feel like a especially female dominated era but it's like actually people from all kinds of diverse backgrounds do knit and part of that could be you know we need to show that in craftivism is that actually craft is diverse craft does actually encompass all aspects of society it's not just you know old ladies like I think people thought it was because that was something I when I was younger at school and um, now craft is cool so it's fine um, but when I was at school quite often people would be like oh that's weird that you sew or that's weird that you knit like we're now lots of friends are absolutely delighted when they get a hand pair of um knitted socks you know from me in the post and it's like wow these are the best things ever and so I think part of that is that yeah craft is cool and it's um great but yeah I agree about um hopefully yeah engaging I think more men as well and I think that's something fashion revolution in general we do get predominantly more women at our events and involved but actually the 16 to 24 age group of young men are the ones that are actually increasing their clothing and um, consumption and it's actually how do we reach those people and that's maybe not through stitching but um i've noticed in edinburgh now at the lyle and scott i think it is that they've now got a repair center and i thought that was actually really interesting a sort of male dominated um clothing brand that they do actually have repair and i thought well if we can just start to um kind of get into it that would be great because but yeah again that's just a whole whole other kettle of fish but um yeah about, they might sorry what about chipping into um education though through this like you're talking about now you know i did do some sewing and things at school but there isn't that yeah so i think is the activism maybe like you're talking about sending things 
could it not be to the educators, the people that are planning the curriculum and things to sort of get them to question why aren't they teaching those skills? Yeah, and that's something that I've kind of thought about with my interest in clothing is that actually maybe and um, they've now actually got it's fab with the girl guides, the guiding movement. They now actually have a craftivist badge. And I'm like, wow, that would have been so cool. They've actually updated all their badges. And now I want to go back to guides <laughs> and add to my already quite big badge collection because I was that kind of person. But I think, yeah, we do kind of need to reach out to schools a bit more. And I think, um, you know, if you're interested in, the, in that sort of thing, go for it. Go talk to... Um, local community groups and schools and youth groups obviously right now difficult but you know it's a lot of planning afterwards um to kind of talk about this sort of education because i think the more people become aware of it the more we get the yeah. message out hi rachel sorry i've just spotted you've raised your hand hi uh hi. yes uh so i'm from germany and um at the moment like in um September there are like our city elections planned and um, like what you said uh, about school like in Germany um, school like the school system is not a city thing but um, like a regional thing mm -hmm. but maybe um, you could like the little cloth things like on the um, how's it called line yeah like what you yeah. said about uh sarah burnett i think she's called yeah sarah um, corbett sorry oh yeah corbett yeah. sorry um like maybe um you could do this on schoolyards or something so like actually the um the pupils and the teachers are getting um that notice um yeah. that there's but do you not a, think it needs to be at a higher level the people that are set in the curriculum because I've worked in a school mm. and you're led by yeah. bureaucracy you're led by what they're telling you you've got to teach those children here so yeah I think part of it has to come go higher up yeah but even though like if the school um like when you start small um like maybe um some teachers would do like um extra yeah um, like those activities <clears throat> like after school yeah um maybe that would be an option too yeah yeah, yeah. i that think the fun. whole thing about textiles is that they're so undervalued and um i mean i spent the last up and before crafting wasn't popular i used to be embarrassed about my stash of material <laughs> um but um, I love to go around charity shops and I pick up button tins. Mm. You know, lo all families used to have a button tin. Yeah. And it's like a box of treasure. And, you know, I think a lot of the problem is that we just don't value those skills at all. Or yeah. haven't I think, you know, that's what's great about having a conversation like that is actually recognising there are other people that do value these things and kind of want to share this message. But yeah, about what you say about the button tin, I used to be obsessed with looking in my um, granny sewing box, like um, just all the different weird bits and bobs that were in there and, you know, a button tin and you put the shiny ones and I, I've i got all my, um, both grandparents, old button tins and, um, you know, they do hold memories and that sort of thing for me that brings yeah. back childhood and um, actually what I now keep my yarn in is an old puffy that was in my grand and granddad's living room and it's got this lid on it so you can keep stuff in it and um, that's where my gran used to keep her yarn and you'd be sitting on it and you'd kind of half fall, it, fall through into, <laughs> through into it um, and I've now got that actually in my room and I think it's really nice to have that object. I've covered it so it's not the same sort of brown corduroy um, but still I still sit on it and fall through it um but it's actually yeah that connection for the generation so i think yes yeah, i'm really questioning how do we get people to value textiles and that's something that i think about all the time at work at home um because it's something that i value them because i'm emotionally attached and i think i've learned about these things but you know when i was younger did i so much maybe not because i didn't know um and so hopefully that's where something like craftivism someone spots something or you know 
finds a little mini statement in their pocket and they think, oh, I've never thought about that. So I think, yeah. So yeah, thanks for a really positive conversation, everyone. It's been really lovely um, hearing from you all. And um, I hope you've found this a useful session or at least interesting to pass an hour of a Friday afternoon. Um, but I'm just aware of the time on Zoom as well and that um, it's about a cup of tea time for me as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, so thanks everyone. I'm going to share um, the slides and hopefully this video will also go up at some point if you know someone that might want to catch up on it or um, you yourself. And um, if you check in with the Fashion Revolution Scotland various social medias, I'll try and update if we do want to do some sort of collective project at some point because I think that'd be really nice and um, not quite sure of the time frame of that because obviously things need to be organized and um, but hopefully we'll put something up in advance because I think it'd be really great and um, to meet more people and to do this together because sometimes it's a bit lonely stitching at home and um, so thanks everyone for joining and I will be in touch with the various um, emails and that sort of thing as well so um, have a lovely day everyone and enjoy I hope there's sunshine where you are because I'm off to go enjoy it so thank you, thank you. Bye. bye bye nice bye. to meet you all bye yeah bye thanks Karen thank you it was lovely <laughs> trying to find out to leave now <laughs> oh yeah sorry I'm just about to end the meeting as well so it should just um stop there